Hello, we've made it 2024. It's actually, I think, the second of our any questions Q and A's for 2024. But anyway, we're back into a routine. We're back into a groove. It's me, Phil, here in the Digital DJ Tips Studio for another 45 minutes of your questions. Anything I can help you with? Now I know our students are here watching this with all of our courses. Also, you could just be watching on Facebook or Twitch or. YouTube or even on X nowadays, wherever you are, wherever you've caught this broadcast, I'm here in the studio. This is where we make all of our training courses, surrounded by all the gear we use to help you with anything that you're stuck on in your DJing right now. So whatever it is, let me know. All the questions are coming in on this computer here and I can see everything you're asking, whatever channel you are on. So don't be shy. Just time while I'm waiting for people to catch up with the broadcast and ask some questions to tell you about a little bit of news. Uh, Digital DJ Tips has a subscription program for serious DJs. We call it Digital DJ Lab. And inside Digital DJ Lab, that's where we put what we call mixed deconstructions, where we take a really cool transition from a big name DJ or something we've seen online and we show you how to do it. We also have things that we call kind of deep dive plans, action plans, where we show you to do pretty advanced stuff on your gear. It's all kind of added to every month. So it's a huge hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of lessons inside Digital DJ Lab. It's not in any of our courses. This is an addition to our courses. This is if you want to stay on top of your game. Why am I telling you about this now? Because if you head to the Digital DJ Tips website and click at the top, you can try Digital DJ Lab right now for just a dollar. This is our only subscription product. This is all we do on subscription. All of our courses, you buy them once, they're yours forever. But we have our subscription program. This is it. And it's a dollar for a month if you want to try it now. So do go and take a look at that. And even if you've tried it before, come and come back and have a look and see what's changed. I think you'll be surprised how much is new inside Digital DJ Lab. Right, so uh, that's what's new here at Digital DJ Tips. What is new with you? Let's find out. Hello to all of our regulars piling in already. Hello to Kesha and Catherine, Catscrews and Miller. Hello to Mike and Mo and Don and Retro uh, all over there on YouTube and Facebook. If you're on X watching this today especially, come and say hello. Oh, I was already on that camera. If you're on X, come and say hello. Um, we would love to hear from our crowd over there because we've only just gone live there uh, like this year. Hello to the Epic Vibe over on Twitch uh, and to DJ VJ Nigel. Hello to DJ Young Shaky. Right, come on, let's have some questions, people. That's what I'm here for. This is from Bikonaut who says, great question this, good one to start us off. What do you think of DJs without headphones? It's a good question because headphones, of course, are essential, or are they? You know, the this is how we DJ, isn't it, right? We've got something playing on this deck, we go over to this deck and in our headphones, we line it up, we check the transition. When we're happy with the transition, we, we mix it in, and then we switch to the other deck on our cues, and we go and do the same thing over here and vice versa and vice versa, right? That's what DJs do. So what about DJs without headphones? What's that all about? Well, look, there's a lot of reasons why you don't use headphones necessarily nowadays. One reason is quite simply because you know what you're gonna play, you know your set, you've rehearsed your set, you've got screens with waveforms on or the waveforms are showing on your controller. And so you can quite happily line music up and mix it in without needing the headphones at all. Also, if you're drop mixing, if you're mixing very quickly and you're not beat mixing between tracks, you're just literally lining a track up, up at a cue point where you know that cue point's where you want to drop it in and you're echoing the old one out and you're dropping a new one in. Again, no need for headphones. A lot of DJs nowadays will, we call it wave riding, where you're literally looking at the waveforms on the screen rather than listening to the tracks in your headphones. I think it's fine. You know, among our, our DJs, uh, on, on the roster of our tutors here. I'm an old school DJ, I know Steve is, so we like our headphones, we just like to DJ the old way. James, as in, of course, James Hype, uh, and um, Layback Luke, they both have IEMs, so they don't have headphones, they have in-ear monitors, so they're doing all the stuff that I just talked about, but it's all happening in their ears without need for monitor speakers or anything. And then Angelo, who is behind our fantastic creative DJing course with DJ Angelo, doesn't use headphones at all because Angelo practices, he rehearses, he's got cue points, he knows the routines, and he's just putting together routines he's practiced before and so on. So for him, it really isn't necessary. So really nowadays, it's, it's headphones are pretty much still a standard thing, right? 
but I don't think they're as essential as they once were. There are things are definitely changing. Uh, great question. What do you think? Should DJs use headphones? Are they cheating if they're not? Are they not really DJing if they haven't got any headphones on? Let us know what you think. Thanks for the question, Baikonur. Great one to start us off with. So this is from Jonathan who says, if you run a mixer through, such as a master sounds mixer, so in other words, a really nice sounding high quality DJ mixer, through something like a Yamaha MG10, which is a small DJ, a small, um, I've got something similar down here, I think. Where did I put it? Where did I put our little mixer? I don't know. Yeah, you know, a little PA mixer, the kind of mixer that you sometimes see DJs using to add a microphone or to take the output from a small controller and split it so they can have a booth monitor as well as the main speaker. Because, you know, a little, little live mixer that costs like $80 or something. Um, if you run a mixer such as a master sound through something like that, do you lose the sound quality? So this is my honest view on this stuff. Sound quality in DJing starts with the recording that you're playing. Unless you're playing a very, very high quality music file that's been mastered properly, then you're losing quality before you even hit play on the track. Once you hit play, the most important thing is the gain staging. That is having your gain controls set so that they're nice and loud, but not going into the red anywhere. And that means on the original incoming source level, this means on the levels down here, this means on the output levels from this, and then on any other mixer it's going through. Typically, if you've got a DJ controller like this in the DJ booth, you'll probably be plugged in to their mixer. So at that point, then also, you've got to make sure the channels on here are not going into the red. It leaves here, and then if you're in a big club, it's going to go to the mixer that a sound engineer is working with, uh, making sure it comes out the PA speakers without any distortion and stuff. There's so much that can go wrong before you've even started talking about the actual equipment you're using. If you take a boutique high-end analog mixer and you plug a DJ source into it, it's gonna sound great when it comes out the other end because those mixes are very good. If you then plug that into a smaller, cheaper mixer, you might lose the tiniest bit of sound quality, true. But the ultimate truth is that as long as you're keeping that signal nice and loud and the file you're playing is nicely mastered and the, the sound engineer in the venue knows what they're doing, I think it's splitting hairs. You know, you read the hi-fi magazines, right? I'm sure you've looked at the, the hi-fi mags, what hi-fi and hi-fi choice and all that. And you look at these record decks that cost $28,000 and you look at these fantastic valve amplifiers and speakers and positioning and room conditioning and all this stuff. I've been listening to great music all my life on great audio systems. I've DJed on some of the best systems in the world. I've DJed at Privilege and Ibiza, which is one of the biggest clubs in the world. I know about what good sound is. And frankly, I think good enough is good enough. So if you really, really care about every last nth of audio quality, then sure, look at every tiny component in your chain. If you're buying boutique mixes that are analog only, that are this and that, then sure, you go plug that into something cheap, you might lose a bit of audio quality. Will anyone else notice? No, they just won't. When it comes to DJing, good is good enough, in my view. But great question, thank you. Uh, Eric, good morning, says Eric. Good afternoon for me. Uh, I have a quick question. What's your opinion about using streaming software versus downloading your music? In other words, why should you use Tidal and SoundCloud and Beatport? Why should you have your own music collection, either from a laptop or on a USB or whatever? My opinion on this is that you should have your own core music collection, which you own. You have the MP3s or the WAV files or whatever format you're in that you own. They're your they're your files, you back them up, you keep a copy of them, you can put them onto your USB or your SD or whatever, they're yours. You have that as your core collection and then have a streaming service as well in your life because streaming services are awesome. So for me, a streaming service is fantastic for music discovery, it's fantastic for learning about music, going down rabbit holes, finding stuff that you want to buy but when you find the tracks you know you want to DJ with, the keepers, then buy them and keep them. Now, if that streaming service also works on your DJ gear, I think that is a bonus. I'll tell you exactly why. Apple, Spotify, very sadly, don't work in streaming services. It was one of the things we talked about in our 
things that we're wishing for in 2024 from the DJ and software manufacturers article. If you didn't see that article, we published it over on the website. Uh, you can go and have a look, have a read, but also you can watch the, the, the live show that we did for it called Our DJ Gear and Software Wishlist for 2024. And one of the things we said on this wishlist was we really wish Apple Music and Spotify would pop up on our streaming services for DJs because it's a great thing to be able to plug a streaming service into your DJ gear and DJ from it, DJ from all the music in the world. I mean, who, who wouldn't want that? It is a great way of discovering new genres. It's a great way, especially if you're DJing somewhere where you've got internet and someone needs to hear something you haven't got, like the couple at a wedding want a song. You know, you've got that song in the cloud, but you haven't got it with you. Well, look, getting onto Tidal, which is one of the services, it is in DJ services. That can save your life. And also, if you just want to play, you just want to grab, like say you're a, um, a commercial DJ, but you want to play a tech house set at home for fun. It, it cuts out all of that trying to find the music and all this stuff, right? What you end up with instead is just plug into a streaming service and DJ, it's great. Being able to actually mix with the tracks that you might want to buy is awesome. So for all those reasons, I think having a streaming service is, is absolutely brilliant. In fact, I'd say it's essential for DJs nowadays. Your job as a DJ is to hear more music than anyone else. Otherwise, how can you call yourself a DJ? In order to do that, you need to be tapped into music everywhere you go. And a streaming service is the way. I think 83% of the world are now using a streaming service. So if you're not, you're actually behind the normal person in the street. That's nowhere for a DJ to be. So for me, yes, you need a streaming service. You don't necessarily need it to DJ with, although it's brilliant if you can, because you can have so much fun with that and it can just save you at the odd gig, but you must own your own music. Why? Because the tracks on streaming services come and go. As the contracts between the streaming service provider and the record labels and the publishers and so on change, then whole collections can move in and out of streaming services. Also, the actual version of the track that you use can go. So the good thing about streaming services and DJ gear is that they figured out, the manufacturers of DJ software, they figured out a way to let you put cue points and loops and all that stuff on tracks that you use from streaming services. Even when you come back, and go back to that track in your playlist on that streaming service, all your cues and loops are there, which is great. But if you put a playlist on a streaming service and come back to that playlist six months later, you'll notice that, I don't know, like say for a hundred tracks, half a dozen of them have gone. If you go back to the streaming service and search that track again, you can find it again and you can put it back in, but it won't be exactly the same version. It, won't, it might sound the same, but it'd be a different upload, maybe from a different compilation album or a remastered version of the album. They took the old one down or whatever. And so you lose all those cue points and those loops and stuff. And you can't rely on the streaming services to always have the tracks that you put into your playlists there when you come back. They're just not permanent enough for pro DJs. So for me, own your main collection, have a streaming service, preferably one that works in your DJ software because they're awesome. Right. Thank you for the question, uh, Eric on YouTube. Uh, right, um, <laughs> you don't like my music, says my laptop is on its last legs. This DJing thing can be expensive, can't it just? Uh, Don says, nice one on the lab. Thank you for opening it back up again. Yeah, we're excited. Hundreds and hundreds of people are already in Digital DJ Lab this time around, giving it a go. Uh, like I say, it's a dollar, so nothing to lose. Um, is a MacBook Air okay to use for Serato DJ? I average six to eight gigs, uh, so hours a night. Um, so, no, yeah, six to eight hours to each gig. Yeah, it's absolutely fine. We're using a MacBook Air here. It's a wonderful computer, as long as it's an M one, like an M1 or an M2 MacBook Air, brilliant computer for running your DJ software. And it will also work nicely with stems, which is cool. Uh, right, so Jason says, hi, Phil. When you don't have space at home for a permanent DJ setup, what sort of practice would you concentrate on most when you do get a chance to set up? Well, I don't think it's any different if you did have a permanent setup, you know, practice what you need to do. Mixing would be the, the, the obvious thing. I think when it comes to practicing mixing, there's two ways to go for it, and I think they're both important. So let's just talk about, in general, practicing mixing and how you should approach it. So the first way is the techniques. It's the micro stuff. It's the, I'm gonna work out how to do a reverb out followed by dropping in on the one on a new track. Or I'm gonna work out how to do a half beat echo, but the echo is gonna be in beat with the new track so that I can make a BPM change. Or whatever you've seen in Digital DJ Lab in our, uh, in our mixed deconstructions or deep dives in there, or on YouTube or wherever in one of our courses, wherever you've seen something you wanna have a go at, then practicing that over and over and 
over and over again until you get it right. The kind of micro stuff, zooming in if you like, is really important because that's how your skills are gonna get better. If you're an athlete, if you're a runner, I'll give you an example of a runner. If you're a runner, right, you're gonna sometimes be sent out there to spend 10 seconds running as fast as you can up a hill and then getting back down and recovering and doing it again, over, over, over again. It's becoming better. You're becoming a better runner, your form's becoming better, your speed's becoming better. But also, to give the running example, sometimes you're gonna go out and you're gonna run for 15 miles or 20 miles for two hours or three hours and you're just gonna run. The DJ equivalent of that is you're gonna turn your gear on and you're gonna play a DJ set from beginning to end and you're gonna pretend that you are actually doing that for real. If something goes wrong, how are you gonna deal with it? You're gonna deal with it. You're not gonna stop and go back to the beginning like a kid with a video game where they lose a life. No, you've got to get to the end of that DJ set. That's teaching you a very different set of skills. Just like with the runner, it's teaching them to perform as they would in a race. With you, it's teaching you to perform as you would in front of a crowd as a DJ. Both things are important. You might try and use some of the skills you've been learning in those other sessions, right? But the thing is, you're not gonna stop if things go wrong. And you're gonna record those sessions and listen back to them. It's the next best thing to playing live in front of an audience, right? So they're the two things I would concentrate on. But also think about possibly getting your gear set up all the time. So at home, I have a desk with my, uh, tucked in the corner, it's a study desk, because I, I, I study as well, you know, do some other stuff away from this. So I've got my study desk in the corner with my computer set up on it, but it's got one of those drawers at the bottom that slides out. And on that slide out drawer, I've got a bit of DJ equipment. So I can hide my DJ gear and just sit at the desk and work. But when I want to, bang, there it is, right? So it's not perfect, it never is when we're compromising, but maybe just try and find a way. Maybe get something small, you know, this is popular. Little thing, I've used this for years, the little Denon DJ um, Prime Go. It's a tiny little thing. Surely there's a way you can set that up somewhere and just have a blanket thrown over it, or even better, because I do love these people. So every now and then, I do like to give my friend Mustafa over at VAC form, a shout, who makes these things. Even better, get one of these. It's just a little um, case that goes over the top um, and it protects the faders and stuff. It's a deck saver, it's called a deck saver case. They sell them for ne nearly all DJ gear. So you can have your gear set up all the time, pop that over the top when you're not using it. If your kids pile their school books on top of it or someone, the cleaner puts a house plant on it and stuff, it doesn't matter. You just take that stuff off and you're ready to DJ straight away. So do try and find a way of getting your gear set up permanently. You know, back to the fitness example. If you join a gym, but it takes a long time to get to the gym, you're less likely to go, right? Same with DJ gear. If it takes time to set up, you're less likely to just have a go. And even if you're not feeling like DJing, you're just like, you've had a hard day at work and stuff. As soon as you start, generally, you start having fun, but anything that's in the way of getting there is likely to stop you doing it, right? So do try and get some kind of setup where you can get at least get it going quickly, Jason. Uh, right, cool, I hope that helped. Um, this is from Eddie, and Eddie says, do you have any indication on the progress of decent stems from Den and DJ? I just held up a piece of Den and DJ gear. So stems, just to remind you, this is a classic stems controller we've got here, wonderful stems controller. It's got an acapella button, it's got an instrumental button, it's got stems split where you can instantly put the acapella on one deck and the instrumental on the other deck, and all these fantastic features. Stems are the battleground at the moment for digital DJing. They are the place where the biggest innovations are being made right now. Being able to separate an acapella from an instrumental, from the drums, from the music instantly is amazing. If only because you're getting the acapella of any song you want ever recorded at the touch of a button. Even if that's all you use it for, it's awesome, right? So they are now extremely good in Serato, Algorithms DJ Pro, Virtual DJ, all brilliant. Record box, no, not so much, they're getting there. Denon DJ though, and by Denon DJ, what you really mean is Engine DJ, which is the software that runs on Denon DJ standalone gear, but also on Newmark Mix Stream gear. Denon DJ, or Engine, has got a very early beta version of this running on just one of its units, the Prime 4 Plus. And you need to get the beta software to, or the beta software for it to work. And it's not very good. Uh, and the reason is quite clear in my mind, it's because they haven't got the power of an M1 or M2 Mac or a very modern Intel processor. They've got what they're working with inside those units, which is far less power. And so it's hard to make them sound good. So the acapellas sound very like underwatery and the, 
and the the instrumentals when you select instrumental kind of pumps away like a like a worn out cassette tape if you're old enough to remember those they're just not very good unfortunately we have no progress of decent stems and i think it's just me speaking i think they overstretched a bit there and i think it's the next generation of standalone gear from that company which will be able to give you good sounding stems of which we have no word at the moment I'm, Sorry. So, yeah, it's, um, you know, they'll be coming for standalone gear. Again, in that 2024 thing, it's one of the things we said we want standalone stems. But want and get are two different things, as the Rolling Stones might have sung once. Something like that. Right, we are here. It's me, Phil, in the studio. We are talking DJing uh, until quarter to the hour. And I've got all your questions coming in on all the platforms. We're live on Facebook, YouTube, Twitch, and X. And I'm really enjoying myself. Hope you are as well. Uh, we are going to now go to Charlie, who just says, yay, I'm here with the goat. Oh, thank you. Although we would say Jazzy Jeff is the goat. Another one of our tutors, by the way. There we go. Um, if you have a pre-planned set, uh, I suppose headphones aren't really necessary. Says you don't like my music. Yeah, it's a good point. We were talking about headphones earlier. Um, Alex says, I've just ordered a DDJ, a DDJ Flex 4. This little controller here, which is by far and away our favorite budget DJ controller. So you made a good choice as far as we're concerned. Uh, but can you recommend some monitor speakers for an absolute starter? There's loads. Pioneer do some, I think they're called the VM40s from memory. Pioneer do them if you want some that'll match this. Um, look, you can spend as much as you want on speakers, but you don't really have to spend an awful lot to get decent sound. To me, if you're a beginner, what you want is speakers that can be near your ears so that you can DJ quietly in the house with them turned down and still get reasonable volume for you. When kids are in bed or whatever, you live in a small flat, you can't really pump it up loud. We, we all know that, right? But also you do need something that can rock out when you want it to. And to me, if you're on a budget, this is a bit of a sideways way of looking at it, but if you're on a budget, to me, one of the best speakers to buy is a set of gaming speakers from the local computer retailer, right? So go to one of the big box retailers that sells, you know, Logitech and, and brands like that, because they give you a subwoofer you can tuck under your desk, which is awesome for dance music because you get the bass. You give, they give you two little speakers that you can have near you for, for the beat mixing, and they're great value, and there's no latency on them. So latency is the killer for DJs. Latency is where there is a gap between what you do on your DJ gear and what comes out of your speakers. And that is a no-go because it's like playing a musical instrument. Like imagine strumming a guitar and the strum, your hands finished, your hands come off the strings and then you hear it. That's not nothing, that's no, no good for a performer, right? The problem with speakers, if you just go into a shop and buy a speaker, even one with a, a line-in socket, right? So you might go and look for a JBL boombox or you know a Bose speaker like that that you can charge up and that you can use for Bluetooth and that you can pair with your mate's speaker in the park or whatever, but that's also got a line in, right? It's got a socket in. So you think, oh, I can plug my DJ game into there. The problem with those is most of them nowadays introduce latency even when you plug something in. It's to do with the way they handle multi-speaker environments and all that stuff. So you really do need speakers that are designed to not give you latency. And so the best way of doing that is obviously to buy studio monitors, which are designed that way, but also, a cheaper way of doing that is to buy either consumer DJ speakers, and again, Pioneer DJ do some cheap ones, uh, or gaming speakers. Gaming speakers are a secret weapon, right? So just go and find some you like the look of, you think you can enjoy using, have a listen to them. Those stores normally have them all set up, right? Uh, and, uh, and get them bought. Uh, that would be my advice. Uh, I enjoy your Flex 4. You've picked a great controller there, Alex. So this is from Mark. Uh, who says, what's that stems news that is running around YouTube about in music? Oh, I don't know. That's exciting. Mark, share. Share the link, please. Uh, I'd love to see that. Um, so Disco Pauly says, uh, David Morales had a right go at a punter, calling him not a DJ as he didn't use cans. I mean, that's like... <laughs> That's like telling the Pope he's not religious, frankly. David Morales is an absolute legend. Uh, so Benny says, I use a MacBook Air M1, replying to Sean, and I haven't had an issue. Thank you for that. What brand is your favorite for mixing? I, I'll, I'll be completely honest with you. I mix with absolutely everything. I mix with everything from, you know, this is a fantastic Rain unit, Rain are wonderful, to, uh, you know, who doesn't love the standalone Pioneer gear in the DJ booth? Uh, but I mix with everything. So for me, as a journalist and as a DJ, I'm happy with any DJ gear. It's like DJing is just, is, is what you do to do to get the music out and 
you know, it's what you, it's the thing between what you're hearing in your head and what you want the dance floor to hear. The gear sits there. As long as the gear can do that, for me, I, I just want to forget about the gear and get on with the DJing bit. That's where my passion really is. So for me, I don't care. Um, most pro DJs don't care because they're just always DJing on exactly what you see here, right? So it's, 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 an, it's an intriguing thing that it's only hobby DJs that seem to have this obsession with the gear. Not that there's anything wrong with it. I love, I love my gear as much as the next person. But the more you move up in DJing and the more the gigs are coming like this and the more other things take over, the less you worry about the little things uh, around the gear. Uh, so um, there's a, some chat going on somewhere about pre-planning sets. Oh, this is DJ Nick's in the mix who says, I have to disagree with pre-planning sets in a set order. How can you adjust to reading the crowd on the dance floor? Well, that's a great question. And we were talking about this earlier with relation to headphones. And I said, Angelo pre-plans things. Angelo doesn't pre-plan a five hour set. If, if our, our tutor Angelo is doing a 20 minute DJ demo showing off a whole load of new skills for a YouTube video, then obviously he's gonna plan everything and he can perform that set without headphones on. When Angelo's playing all night, of course he doesn't do that. And of course he'll take his headphones and DJ in the, you know, the normal way if you like. And I totally agree, you should never pre-plan a set like that. I mean, the first DJ set I ever played when, when I was mixing, it was on vinyl. I remember it clearly, it was in a club called Testa Rossa, which is round the corner from the Hassi Hacienda in Manchester. I'll say that again. <clears throat> it was around the corner from the Hacienda in Manchester. And uh, I played my first gig at this place. And it was nerve wracking to the point where I was, uh, I couldn't get the needle on the record. I was trembling that much. And I had my set written out on a bit of card. And just like a kid cheating on his, you know, French one to 10 in a test at school with a little bit of paper hidden. I had this little thing hidden down by my DJ box and I was, it told me what record to play next and when to mix it in. It's the only way I could get through my first set. But of course, we don't want to be doing that as a rule in DJing. The rule that we teach here at Digital DJ Tips is really simple because the other thing you don't want is to have what people unfairly, I think, because other software is available, what people call Serato face, right? Where you're staring like that and they're sco you can tell they're scrolling through 5,000 tunes thinking, what do I play next? What do I play next? What do I play next? You don't want that either. So the way we teach here at Digital DJ Tips is that you should take twice the amount of music you think you want to play in any given gig. So let's say that you're booked to play for two hours and you generally play two minutes of a track, right? So that's 30 tracks an hour. So that's 60 tracks you're likely to play. So you should pack a set of 120 tracks, twice that number. And you should go into your DJ software and you should have a new crate or a new playlist and call it, you know, tonight's gig and go through all your music, look at the stuff that's worked at previous gigs, look at the new songs you really know you want to play, look at songs that you'd like to play if you get a chance and if the crowd are having it, throw a few old favorites in, think about what happens if the people who turn up aren't who I think and they're gonna need something different. Have I got a plan B? Have I got a plan C? few tracks to cover those things. Now you've got a set. Now you're gonna double check that set. And because it's in a playlist or a crate, as opposed to in your main library, the beauty about playlists and crates in DJ pre preparation software or DJ performance software is you can change the order, right? So then you can move those songs around and roughly plan. These are the songs I'm gonna play in the first hour, second hour, or the first half hour, second half hour, third half hour, fourth half hour. And from top to bottom, just like in the old days of DJ, when we were packing our record boxes, I still have my record box from back then, we would pack the set from the front of the box to the back of the box. So we would work through the box when we were DJing. We weren't playing all the records, no. What we were doing was making sure that we wouldn't be flicking from the front to the back of the box every single time we wanted another record because the stuff we were playing early was likely to be at the front. You can do that with your playlists. And now you're gonna go away and you're gonna play your gig and you're gonna, get, you're gonna get back and you're gonna see that you've played exactly half the music. So you've had enough music to move around and to react to the crowd and go off in a direction they're liking and maybe not play stuff you thought you would, but not so much music that you're getting stuck staring at your screen. When you see DJs and they're just in the mood and they're, everything's flying around and they're just laughing and having fun and chatting to people and the next chunk, track comes in, it's the perfect track, they mix it well, they've just got no cares in the world, to get to that point, trust me, takes a lot of preparation. Now, the very top of their game DJs who are playing six nights a week and have been doing that for five years probably don't need to go to the lengths I've just gone to because it's almost like their whole collection is constantly in that state of just been played. I know what it is. I know what I want to play next. But for everyone else, planning each set in the way I just said is the way forward. So I totally agree with you. DJ Nick's in the mix over there on Twitch. You should never play a pre-planned set because otherwise you might as well just press play 
on a recording of that set. Um, you're right. Uh, hello to Tom Tom, who says I'm here for my second time. This is from that one who says, is it better to run speaker power direct to a power outlet or from a power strip then to a wall outlet? It doesn't matter as long as the ampage is sufficient on whatever it is you're plugging into. So this means that you've got to use heavy enough duty cables and fuses so that when you turn those speakers up loud, they don't just trip out. I've got a really good story for you here. This is going back to 1987 when I was in my first year of DJ, I had the new single from New Order. New Order were a big deal back then. And we, I was doing the school uh, disco. Don't think, yeah, it was. It was an end of term school disco, but it wasn't in the school. It was in a club around the corner. And uh, I wanted to play this as my first tune. So the idea was, everyone was going, and we set up a mobile disco rig, right? So this is just a hall. It, I say it was a club. It's like a, you know, a social club. And we set up our disco stuff. Um, and I wanted to play this New Order song. All our school, all the, the girls are arriving and everyone wanted to impress. So the idea was that we were going to play quiet, right? And then when people arrived, we were going to knock out, when, when the place was getting full, we were going to knock out, well, I'm getting goosebumps even talking about this, I love it. Uh, we were going to turn out the house lights, turn on our, 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 our disco lights, and I was going to double the volume and play this True Faith by New Order, right? So this is what we were going to do. So we did it. Trouble is, when I turned the volume up and hit go on that, we, we got about five seconds and then everything went, ooh. So now we're in a dark room full of all the people we wanted to impress and the power's gone off. And obviously, it's not a good look. I'll tell you what happened. What happened was that I got an extension cable, right? So this is one of those cables that comes in a circle and you wind it in, right? A bit like on a, on a vacuum cleaner, you wind it in. And I plugged it into the wall, but I didn't have to go very far from the wall to my speakers, to our amplifier and speakers. It, you know, this is like a 15 foot cable and I only had to go four foot, right? So there's 11 foot of the cable is still inside this reel. And I'd plug the speakers into that. And the trouble with this, is, and it had a trip switch on it, right? It had a little thing that popped out if there was too much going on. And the problem is, and the lesson I learned, is that you have to unwind those cables all the way if you're gonna be pushing them to the max. Because otherwise, something weird electrical happens with this coiled up cable that just trips it out. And so you've got to be careful if you're not plugging directly into the wall outlet that anything you use, any extension cables, any you know adapters and stuff, are possible, uh, po are able to handle the current that's going to happen, the ampage that's going to happen when you turn your gear up. So it's always worth when you set, when you are setting up your gear, having a full dress rehearsal, which means playing at full volume with everything turned on for ten minutes, just to make sure that everything is fine in that respect. So I hope that is useful to you there. Um, so. Um, that was um, that one on, uh, on YouTube who asked that question. People, we've got about 10 minutes left. So I always say this, if you are asking a question here and I don't get to you, and normally I don't get to everyone. I mean, I never, in fact, I never get to everyone. Uh, I'd say most questions don't get answered. If that's you, my advice is this, every single Digital DJ Tips student, which means anyone who owns a course from Digital DJ Tips, gets invited now, as of this year, to two special live shows, which are only for students, which happen inside our student-only group. And in those live shows, we guarantee every single question gets answered. So if you want my attention for your question guaranteed, then you just got to become a student, buy a course. Now, now the easiest way of becoming a student right now, today, is to go to our site, click Try Digital DJ Lab for just a dollar and go to our subscription DJ learning platform only for serious DJs, right? This isn't for beginners. This is for you if you've already taken one of our courses or you're already DJing, you just want lots of ideas to get better. By doing that, you can join Student Hub, which is our student group, and then come to those live shows. This is currently a dollar for a month. Uh, but only for a few days. It just happened yesterday, went live yesterday. So it's a good excuse. But also there's loads and loads of other ways of getting uh, involved with Digital DJ Tips. If you're a beginner, go to the DJ Courses page and grab the complete DJ course. The first course you see is the one uh, to get you up to speed. If you're new or you're returning to DJing, this is where most people start. But I thought I'd give you that lab option there as well because hey, it's live at the moment. Right, okay, let's uh, go grab uh, a couple more of the questions then that we will get to answering. 
Um, just a few people commenting on this DJ set thing. Dan is saying, I rarely play my sets beyond the first few tracks. I rarely plan my sets beyond the first few tracks. It depends on the mood of the night and the crowd. So for me, headphones are necessary to preview. Yeah, for most DJs, they're still, still very necessary. Agree completely. Uh, right, so um, this is from Alex who says, Phil, I'm thinking about purchasing a Reloop mixed tool MIDI controller, just if you don't know what that is, people. Uh, it looks like this, it isn't this. This is a tractor version, uh, but it looks like this. It's a little modular DJ controller. Now it's slightly different to this one. I've got that upside down because uh, it's got faders on it and stuff. But ultimately it's a little controller that you plug in and it doesn't give you control over everything. It just gives you control over certain parts of your DJ gear. Very useful for going into a pro DJ booth like this because you can easily slide one of the CDJs aside and tuck it in. And then you can control your software with their mixer and CDJs and so on with all the extra functions. So they're modular controllers. Uh, Layback Luke uses one. Uh, not this one, he uses the Reloop mix tool that we're talking about here. Um, modular controllers are a good way forward. So anyway, um, this is uh, the question that I just, just scrolled off the top because so many people uh, are chatting about stuff, but I'm gonna find it again by scrolling down. It's Alex. Um, I'm thinking about buying a Reloop Mix Tour MIDI controller. Is that a good choice for a beginner or should I buy a typical controller? You should buy a typical controller. It's a pretty specialized thing uh, and you will miss, you'll wish you had a typical controller. It's one of those controllers that you buy if you know, uh, you kind of know what you want. So this is interesting. Did you get the new Everse 12? I don't even know what that is, Wave Sounds. So um, I'll look out for it or maybe you can let me know. Um, so, um, is AI going to replace DJs, says Juan, who knows? Uh, we don't have a crystal ball, but as long as, there are, uh, as long as there are people on the dance floor, I think people playing the music are probably going to have the edge. That's my view. Uh, this is Alex who says, I tried Algorithm's DJ Pro software after watching your comments on those flexible beat grids. I was impressed. Anyway, uh, to analyze the tracks in DJ Pro and transfer them to other software, how do I do it? If you're a Mac user, look at an app called DJCU. You can just Google those letters, DJCU, and you'll find an app from uh, our friend Mixmaster G, which uh, can convert anything to anything with some various add-ons for Denon and things like that. But he's the man, if you're a Mac user. If you're not, then there are other apps out there. I think Lexicon DJ can do it as well. I haven't tried Lexicon DJ, but I do know it works on other platforms. So take a look at that. Russell says, is the DDJ Flex 6 a good upgrade from a DDJ Flex 4? I've been mixing for 30 years. No, a DDJ Flex 6 is a, D, is, is a DDJ Flex 4 with bigger jog wheels and some fiddly things on. Um, you're not getting an upgrade there really. You're just getting a bigger box. Uh, save up a bit more and get something that costs you four figures um, from a DDJ Flex 4. You're not really upgrading there. You're not upgrading the sound, the inputs, the outputs. You're just getting bigger jog wheels. I don't think it's worth it myself. Um, so uh, Nick says, I'm watching your record box course now. Um, I downloaded the samples in Rekordbox, but I can't seem to find out how to import them. It's at the top, it's in the file menu at the top. It does say in the lesson. If you get stuck though, just ask us in the lesson underneath and maybe, maybe post a screenshot and we'll help you out there, uh, Nick. That's, uh, that's what that bit is for. It's why our courses are more than just a login because you can ask questions and get help right there when you need it. So ask in there. Uh, talking about streaming services, won't we? Roman says, I use Tidal for streaming to respond to requests. I use it a lot when I'm playing garden and street parties. Uh, so thanks for sharing that. Yeah, streaming services are good. Uh, right, this is from Josh who says, hi Phil, it's good to be back on the stream. Well, it's good to have you back on the stream, Josh. Um, a quick one, how have you found the Flex 10 Jog Surrounds? I've had the Flex 10 since release day and I'm still not a massive fan. Compared to the 1000, it feels cheap. I actually don't feel it's any different to the 1000 as far as how it feels goes. Um, so for me, yeah, I've, I've been fine with it. I like it. Um, so Bobby, Algorithms DJ Pro used to have an agreement with Spotify. When they took it away, um, some users switched to Tidal. Yes, Spotify doesn't have a DJ agreement with any app to DJ, unfortunately, right into it. Um, one or two more then, and then I got to get out of here, people. Speaking of running, that's what I'll be doing, going on my uh, evening run before dinner. Um, it's wet here, actually. It's not very nice out there today, so hopefully I won't get out. The last two nights I've got soaked. I'm hoping it'll be third time lucky. Um, so what should we do here? Billy. Uh, Billy says, I like to 
remix and produce tracks in, in any way to make them unique. Yeah, good idea, Billy. Uh, then I use those during my sets with a mixed collection of other producers and DJs tracks to set me apart from any other DJ that may entertain the same audience. Then I love watching how the crowd reacts to my sets week after week. You know, people who love that idea but get scared by it uh, need to understand, and if this is you, listen, need to understand it's not hard to start making your own bootlegs, mashups, remixes, and re-edits of tracks. As soon as you hear a popular track and think, oh, I wish it did that. I wish the breakdown was longer. I wish the vocal wasn't there. I wish it had a longer intro. I bet that would go really well if I put it with that. I just want to put a bass line I can hear in my head under that and it would be better. As soon as you're thinking those things, you don't need to be musically trained. You don't need to be able to play an instrument. You need, as our tutor James Hype famously said recently, you need your laptop and your brain. And you can do it. And let me show you how you can do it. So we sat down, one of the most prolific re per people who do this in Pro DJ World is um, Layback Luke. Layback Luke has done thousands of remixes and re-edits and mashups and bootlegs. We sat down with Layback Luke and Layback Luke's lap laptop and Layback Luke uh, spent a week with us showing us exactly how this is done. Go to the courses page on Digital DJ Tips, click on Layback Luke's bootlegs, mashups and re-edits. And this is where you'll find out how you can make unique versions of songs to play in your own DJ sets. It's an absolutely awesome investment in your DJing if you want to stand out from the crowd in exactly the same way that we were just talking about because nothing makes a DJ stand out from the crowd when, let's be honest, every DJ has got access to everything than having slightly unique versions of songs that you have made yourself. So thank you very much for sharing that. Um, Right, so I'm going to uh, go to Colin now on YouTube, uh, sorry, on Facebook, who says, I hope Pioneer works soon on the new record box app uh, for iOS, Android, because I've got a Flex 4 and I use it with DJ Pro for the iPhone at the moment. It's streets ahead of the Pioneer app. So hopefully they'll spend some time on it and at least add Beatport into it, which I find strange it was not included. After all, it was a big feature and being able to use it uh, on the Flex 4 with your tablet would be awesome. Yeah, you know, Pioneer DJ does have an app for phones and stuff, but the, the main use for that app at the moment is so you can prepare music on the go, and then when you get to a setup like this, you can just quickly play music directly from your phone uh, into a setup like this. You know, it's quite cool the way it works with that, not only that, with the Opus Quad and so on. Uh, and the, the kind of using it as a full-on DJ platform, uh, which you can do with the Flex 4, which we are another reason why this is one of our favorite baby controllers, uh, is not as good as, as you said, it's not as good as Algorithms DJ Pro at the moment. Uh, Algorithms DJ Pro rules on the iPhone and the iPad for sure. Uh, are you still working to reviewing DJ Studio, says Larry. Yes, Larry, but it's NAM next week. NAM always means, which is the North American Music Makers Association, something like that. Anyway, it's where all the new DJ gear and equipment and software gets launched. Uh, it's NAM next week, so there's stuff coming up that we have to cover first. So we will get around to it at some point. It looks like a great app, DJ Studio, by the way. And we do talk about it often because we like the look of it. Uh, and then finally, this is from Sony Man, and this is our last question. Uh, Sony Man says, can you explain basically what is pitch and time? And what can it be used for? This feature came when I purchased my Rev7. Serato users or potential Serato users, listen up, because you're gonna learn something here, not only about what pitch and time is, but about what Serato does with this thing. So pitch and time is a way of altering the key of your tracks without altering the pitch. So this is a Serato controller, right? If I play a track on here and I move this down, then it's going to slow down, but it's also gonna go lower like this, right? Because I've just slowed it down. And then as I speed it up, it's gonna get faster and faster and faster and faster and faster. And it's going really fast like this and it'll slow it down again like that, right? That's what happens with these controls. If you use the key lock, which is this button here, then it's gonna get slower when you slow it down like this. But the pitch is gonna stay exactly the same. So it sounds a lot more natural, even though you're speeding it up or slowing it down, it's not sounding like a chipmunk or someone speaking really, really low, right? And the same with music, right? So the key lock does that. Now, Serato has key lock built in. It's not very good. You go down there and it sounds a bit rough. You go up there and it sounds a bit rough. Pitch and time makes it sound good when you do that. Secondly, pitch and time allows you to slow the track down or speed it up to the speed you want it to go at and then alter the pitch. So then I could have the track playing like there to match this deck, right? And I could also change the pitch 
up or down a couple of notes, so the key matches this deck as well. So it opens up a whole new way of mixing because you've got key shift and key lock. Uh, sorry, key shift and key sync, which is an awesome way of mixing. I'd say it's essential on DJ gear nowadays, right? So that's what it is. The reason you had a card or a coupon or something in the box when you bought your Rev7 is that amazingly, and quite shamefully, I think, sorry, Serato, but it's what I believe, Serato DJ Pro, yes, that app that costs you $300 or whatever, doesn't have this as standard. Like every DJ app has this as standard, everyone, apart from Serato. Now they know that that's a bit lame, right? They know that's a bit unnecessary, they know that's wrong. So with pro controllers like this, and the Rev7 and others, you, yes, when you plug it in, it will unlock Serato DJ Pro, great, but you don't get that really important extra feature. So they give you a little card in the box, which you can then enter into your Serato account and they will give you that feature as well. But I think it should be with the, the version of Serato that these things unlock anyway, because it's with all other software. And even worse, if you realize you haven't got it, you can't just go and buy this little add-on, you used to be able to. You have to buy the next version of Serato up, which costs you hundreds more again. It's all wrong, they need to fix it. So that's what it is, uh, and that's why you've got that card in your box, so you're lucky. People trade these cards on Reddit and eBay and stuff, right, because they don't want to spend all that money getting the, getting the full version of Serato just with this tiny little feature that should be there anyway. Right. Time to go, thank you very much for joining me. I am back on Tuesday next week when I think our Tuesday show is going to be our take on the best DJ software 2024. So it's an exciting one that because every year we, we look at things like the stems and the integrations and the costs. So Serato, you better watch out. I'll be repeating that next week. Uh, and all the other things so you can decide whether Recordbox, Tractor, Virtual DJ, DJ Pro, Serato indeed, or any other platform is right for you. So that's what we're covering next week, Tuesday. Uh, it's going to be at 4 p.m. London, 11 a.m. Eastern. Uh, so I'll see you then. And the next one of these is in two weeks time. These are on the first and third and sometimes the fifth Thursday of the month. So generally it's, they're every two weeks apart. Uh, and if you're a digital DJ tip student on those Thursdays in between, we're live inside Student Hub, which is what I was telling you about earlier. So I will see you in there the inner circle. Uh, right, get good, get out there, make the moments, people. Thank you very much for joining me today. For me, Phil, here in the studio. Bye for now.